Well, hello. I'm Pastor Chad Peterson, lead pastor at Bethlehem Lutheran Church in St. Cloud, Minnesota, and I want to personally welcome each and every one of you to this online worship opportunity. Please know that wherever and whenever you are joining us, you are welcome here because we are following the example of Jesus in welcoming everyone for just who they are as they are. If you are struggling to make it through another week, if you messed up another relationship, even if you haven't gotten dressed yet today, we trust that God will meet you in this time of worship. We know that God will work through our song, our prayers, our message to refresh your soul and prepare you for another week of being the hands and feet and heart of Jesus for your neighbors. As we prepare for our time of worship together, we are reminded that we are gathered in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Too often, the biblical story is heard through ears that have not learned to hear these stories in context, through ears that have not had the opportunity to appreciate the quality, depth, and impact that these stories have on your life, on what it means for you to be a human being. Too often, God and Jesus sound like flat characters that are more appropriate as children's story characters than actual experienced realities that bring hope in the midst of your struggles and offer value in the midst of your in the midst of well your life <laughs> so here's the story that we're going to focus on today it comes from the gospel of john the 11th chapter i invite you to follow along as i read now a certain man was ill lazarus of bethany the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it's for God's glory so that the son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, Though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt down at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had, would have been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. 
But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone! Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench, because he's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with, with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. It's our story to focus on today. So, do you hear this story? I mean, I mean, actually, do you hear this story? Well, maybe I can help. I want to take you inside your imagination for a moment. Allow me to paint a picture for you, and I want you to just go to where I describe. It is quiet, dark, and peaceful inside your bedroom. All of a sudden, there is a noise. You sit up startled. Something has pulled you out of your sleep, but you're not quite sure what it was. The sky is still black. It's not time to be up yet. Without thinking, you glance at the time. 2.30 a.m. Just then the noise repeats itself. It's a familiar sound and, and you know what to do now. Still half asleep, you grab your phone next to you on the bedstand and in a tired, scratchy voice, you answer, hello? On the other end is your mom, or maybe your brother, or maybe your good friend. The seriousness in his or her voice paired with the fact that it's 2.30 in the morning, immediately sharpens your senses. You are alert and on edge, bracing yourself for something that you know cannot be good. The words that follow are surreal, as they tell of a loved one who is en route to receive emergency services and is not doing well. A hundred different thoughts flood your head, but your mind, sharp with adrenaline, processes them and moves you to action. Bed covers fly, clothes are yanked on, and in one fluid motion, keys, wallet, and phone fill your pockets as you run out the door and to your car. You feel worried, but more than that, you feel a sense of urgency. You must get to the hospital as fast as you can to be with your loved one, to be with family and friends. It's amazing how nothing else seems to matter. Not work, not your schedule for tomorrow, not the shopping trip or vacation. Nothing, nothing is more important than being present to the one whom you love. What else would you do? I mean, what else could you do at such a time, such a time of great need. Once upon a time, Jesus received a 2.30 a.m. phone call. On the other end of the line, he heard the pleading desperation behind the voices of his friends, Mary and Martha, as they told him that Lazarus was in the hospital and not doing well. These sisters knew Jesus. They were close to him. They knew if anyone could provide a cure for their loved one, it was him. Jesus had done it before for others, so how much more quickly would he come now for the ones he loved? <laughs> so after hanging up the phone, Mary and Martha watched and waited for the one who had the power to help them in their darkest moment. An hour went by and Jesus did not come. Two hours went by and still Jesus was not there. Three, four, five, six hours and still no one came. 
As the women waited, Lazarus grew worse and worse. It was so painful to hear when the doctor said that there was nothing more that could be done. Where was Jesus? The next day arrived and the situation grew worse. The sisters watched as Lazarus' breathing became shallow and labored. And still, Jesus, the one who made God's healing a reality, who made God's love and mercy a reality. I mean, this Jesus was nowhere to be found. Finally, exhausted, unable to go on, Lazarus breathed his last breath. His family was present with him. They had watched their loved one's chest rise, fall, and not rise again. And Jesus? Jesus was nowhere to be seen. What followed was silence and sounds of grief. Lazarus was dead, and Jesus, the one whom Mary and Martha turned to in their time of need, the one whom they called on to come and be present with their family, the one who described himself using such metaphors as life-giving water, where was he? Where was this life? What important thing had kept Jesus from preventing the grief that now enveloped those whom he loved? I mean, hopefully, there was a pretty good reason. As John's Gospel unfolds, Jesus was said to have simply stayed two days longer in the place he was. In Greek, there is a certain connotation to this word translated as stayed. It, it reads like this, Jesus tarried, Jesus drug his feet, Jesus procrastinated, Jesus dinked around. In other words, Jesus just did not come. It's an interesting piece of the story, and although it's a small detail, I think it's important because the Gospel writer knows what we all have experienced. Something that we know to be true that affects all of us and our faith on a very deep and personal level. There are many times in life when it feels like God is delayed. When we cry out to God only to encounter silence, nothing. Like Mary and Martha, we know what it is to call out to Jesus, to God, in our moment of need, only to be left waiting and wondering if we were heard. I mean, can you name a specific occasion in your life when you have felt this way? I really think you can. I mean, just take a second to seriously think about this. The silence of God is a reality that most have experienced, but for whatever reason, few are willing to acknowledge it or talk about it. In the past, I have spoken with individuals and families undergoing great struggles. Some of these individuals spoke very confidently of the comforting presence of God, although the hesitation and the quiver in their voice led me to believe that it was not quite that simple. It's almost as if they had to say that, e even though they did not experience it. Others were outright angry, not only about their circumstance in life, but the fact that they felt like God had abandoned them. God was dead, abandoning them in awful isolation, and they were angry. And I get it. In the face of death, tragic or otherwise, in the stress of navigating the social hierarchy of high school, in the yelling matches of a messy divorce, in the news that is delivered from the 2.30 a.m. phone call, we might know more than we want to about the silence of God. We might identify very closely with Mary and Martha as they waited in hope for a Jesus who drug his feet and never came when they needed him the most. It is only much later, after the funeral, after the burial, after several days when all hope was gone, that Jesus arrives to meet a Mary and a Martha who are just shy of hostile towards him. They say, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. 
That is their accusation. It's their complaint. It's their grief. Remarkably, Jesus is moved by the whole situation. Jesus feels what they feel. He is sympathetic to the pain and hurt caused when the relationships that bring us so much joy and meaning come to an end by whatever means. And from this, Jesus brings forth life in a way in which nobody, nobody would have ever expected. <laughs> Lazarus comes out of the grave. The silence of God, the absence of Jesus give way to great hope and great joy. The gospel story ends in a good place for Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Many people who have experienced the disturbing and isolating silence of God in moments of darkness, loss, and grief have later in time come to experience the great joy and hope of a loving God. <laughs> that being said, that does not negate the reality of the grief and despair of those who are currently struggling to find any good news in their present set of circumstances. For them, Jesus is still dragging his feet. God is still silent. And this is where we come in as a community of faith, as individual Christians. We are called to be present to those individuals who struggle. We can let them know that they're not alone, that we too, along with a whole list of biblical characters, know what it is to wait for Jesus, for a God who seems to be delayed. We can share our own stories of waiting and wondering. We can talk about our own anxiety and uncertainty, and then and only then can we share the good news of hope and healing of a God who grieves with us and walks with us to bring about hope and life when we least expect it. So it's one thing to say that. I think it's an entirely another thing to practice that. My hope is that we can go beyond hearing these stories as just good stories and instead hear them as stories that ground us in a new reality. The reality that Jesus called the kingdom of God, a, a world where the essence of God comes alive in real ways. Th this is really hard to do by yourself, which is why we need to practice this in a community with other people. You're not called to simply be passive recipients of religious products. Uh, the metaphor the biblical writers use is that you are to be salt and light. You are called to bring out the God flavors and the God colors of this world, but this is hard to do unless we intentionally practice it on a semi-regular basis. And so I was thinking about this. I mean, this week we are celebrating All Saints, a church tradition that lifts up and remembers those who have gone before us. As part of, of the Bethlehem community, we specifically remember those who have died this last year as we pray for them, which you will hear later in our prayers. The families of those that we are remembering are people who are still very much dealing with grief. It's still raw for many of these people. These are people needing to know that they are not alone, that people care. Some of these people have called out in fear and anxiety to a God who seems to be dragging God's feet. So my question for you is this, will you let these families know that they are not alone? Will you write them a note as they wait, as they hope for God to show up, as they work to accept the changes in their life and move toward healing, and in doing so, bring the love of God into their lives? Now, you don't have to be a professional writer. You don't have to know the right thing to say. You don't have to know who these people are. Just share yourself with them. Share God's love with them. If you are young and can't write, well, maybe, you know, you could email us a picture, something that we can share. So to see the instructions that I'm asking you to do, I'm inviting you to do, and to write your note, I would invite you to click the link in the video description. That way you'll be able to send us digitally a note that we can pass on 
to these individuals who are in the midst of loss and grief. And in doing so, practice the story that we just heard today. The good news that we hear today is that we are not alone, wondering where God is, and, and then find that, find that God shows up in the most unlikely of places, in the midst of the, un, in the, midst of the most unlikely of, of times to give us hope right when we think it's impossible. I mean, this is incredible news, and I invite you today to be a part of that and make that a reality in your life and find the joy and the meaning in the life that can come from it. This is the good news we hear today. Thanks be to God for that. Amen. If today's reflection speaks to you in some way and you feel it would be well received by others in your life, well, then please feel free to share it. Here at Bethlehem Lutheran Church, we wish to follow Jesus' example of sharing his life-giving message with others, regardless of who they are or where they come from. We thank you for taking time out of your busy day and life to watch, listen, and be fed. Continuing to offer our online and in-person ministries are made possible through your support and generosity. If you feel that you are in a place to give of your time, talents, and treasure to the mission of Bethlehem Lutheran Church, you can do so in a variety of ways. We have many opportunities to volunteer or to participate in the life of the congregation, and you can find those on our website or through subscribing to our weekly e-communication, The Shooting Star. If you are in a place to give of your finances, you can do so through our website, through mailing a check to the church, or by texting a dollar amount through text to give at 320-289-4093. Any way you are able to support the mission of the church is greatly appreciated. We join our hearts in a word of prayer. Gracious God, we give you thanks that you have claimed us as your beloved children. And yet there are so many voices and experiences that pull us away from the identity that you've given us. Be with those who are told and have come to believe that they do not matter, that they are ugly, unloved, unwanted, unworthy, an enemy, a mistake, an evil person, stupid. Be with those who have given up, those who are contemplating suicide, be with those who are sick in their bodies, minds, and spirits, 
and those who live lives that are far less than you intend for your good creation, especially those that we name out loud or in the silence of our hearts. Gracious God, send us out to be your hands, feet, and voice in this world, offering support, love, grace, and mercy. Help us to share our stories where your activity has resonated with our lives, that others might find hope and support. Today, as we celebrate all saints, we remember those who are grieving and those who are in the midst of struggles. Gracious God, we pray for those who have lost loved ones this last year. You have created us to be in relationship. And when we lose those we love, the loss is powerful. Today, we remember and pray for those in our community who have lost loved ones. Today, we remember Bonnie Cater, Dorothy Norton, Betty Lundgren, Wayne Moe, Doug Johnson, Tiffany Haugen, Doris Madsen, Shirley Bergeson, Carol Schauer, Tony Kipka, Nancy Madden, Barbara McPhail, Owen Hagen, Lou Johnson, Gilbert Hammond, Nyabom Miyang, James Miller, Charles Deegan. Gracious God, we commend these individuals to your never em- your never ending love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Together we pray the prayer that our Lord has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us in the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And now as you go on your way from where you are to re-engage with your community, take God's blessing with you. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. 